Hello, everybody. I'm back again. Uh, just really happy to see you. I feel so privileged and blessed to um, do this Bible study with you. Uh, it's a real privilege. Why God would choose somebody like me, <laughs> I don't know. His grace. Uh, but he's a wonderful, wonderful father, and he loves us and cares about us. And um, he's given me the, the blessing of sharing some good news in a world where there's a lot of bad news. So I'm glad to be able to bring some good news to you. Today I have a very happy or happier uh, message than some of them have been. Uh, we're continuing to do Faces Around the Cross. And today we're going to take a look at John, the beloved disciple. Um, we're going to read from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, 28 through 37. Again, John, the beloved disciple, the Gospel of John, chapter 19, I'm beginning with verse 28. And here's what John records. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath. Because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' uh, side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has taken testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones would be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The Apostle Paul wrote in his first letter to the Corinthians these words. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. My friends, don't ever think that your life is not important, especially to Jesus. If your life and my life, if our lives are open to him, he can do absolutely remarkable things in and through us. That's pretty exciting to think about that. Now, there was 
2,000 years ago, a young fisherman, probably in his late teens, and his name was John. He and his brothers, brother, excuse me, James, and their father, Zebedee, were fishermen. They fished on a boat on the Sea of Galilee with their partner, Simon Peter. I remember um, four months ago in January of this year, um, took a little trip to Israel. And one of the highlights was being in a boat on the Sea of Galilee and seeing that the beautiful sea, inland sea, and then surrounded by the mountains. It was just glorious. I'm thinking that maybe these men uh, that we're talking about here could call themselves the Zebedee Fishing Company. Little did this young man know about what was going to be in store for him. He thought, like his father, he would be a fisherman for his whole life. He would be a fisher all right, but a fisher of men, not of just fish. He was a humble carpenter. Um, a humble, I'm sorry, a humble carpenter came from this very same area, the, the area of Galilee, from the town of Nazareth. Um, and he was an itinerant preacher. And he called John to follow him. John felt absolutely compelled, as were 11 other men, uh, to go along with him. In this case, it was John, Peter, and James who became the closest disciples of Jesus. They were kind of on the inner circle of the 12 disciples. As an eyewitness of the life, <clears throat> death, and resurrection of Jesus, it became clear to John that Jesus was the Word of God the Messiah, the Lamb of God, who comes to take away the sins of the world, the Son of God, and the Savior of the world. All of those phrases appear in his writings. So touched was John by the remarkable ministry and life of Jesus that he wrote the fourth gospel, which we now refer to as the Gospel of John. A very interesting gospel. 90% of the information that he writes is not found in the synoptic gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He's got a lot of un uh, unique information that he shares with us. It is a very, very beautiful account of what happened. John may have been a mere fisherman, and his writing is nowhere near as complicated as that the writing of Luke and Paul, who were very, very educated men. Luke was a doctor. Paul, uh, of course, was a rabbi and had a lot of education. And their sentences sometimes <laughs> go on and on and on. But John wrote very, very, very simply, but oh, so profound. Any time Nowadays, when translators begin to translate the Bible into a new language, oftentimes, almost always, the first book of the 66 books of the Bible that are, are translated is the Gospel of John. It says something. John begins his Gospel stating closely that Jesus and the Father are co-equals. They were together from before the beginning of time. It says in the beginning of John's gospel, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So this is saying that Jesus was a co-equal with the Father and that he was with God, the Father, and he is God. Later in one of his letters, uh, and he wrote uh, the three letters of John, John 1, John 2, John 3, towards the end of the New Testament, during the days when he was pastoring, many years after Jesus had been crucified and raised from the dead, he writes these words, 
that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we saw it and we testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Do you sense the excitement with which John writes can you imagine the simple man being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? God come in the flesh for over three years, eating with him, walking with him, watching him do miracles, saying the greatest things that have ever been spoken by anyone in human form. Wow, how amazing would that be? A man fellowshipping, serving, and worshiping Almighty God, who was flesh and blood right before him. Wow, what a privilege. John closes his gospel with these words. This is the disciple who is bearing witness to these things, and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true, and there were many people still alive when he was writing these things that saw these things, and said, yes, he's telling the truth. But there are also many other things which Jesus did were every one of them to be written. I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that could be written. You know what we've got here in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? We have a highlight film. We are just skimming over the top the things that Jesus said and did. You know how we, we watch the Super Bowl and it takes three hours of play and uh, all these different plays occur and, and there's a couple of key plays that determine the outcome of the game. And the next day we put on ESPN and, uh, and we see three plays maybe. Just the very, very basic highlights. Well, that's what we have here in the Gospels. We have so, so little of what Jesus said and did, but enough for us to believe that he is the Son of God, God Almighty come in human form. Wow. So John was one of the three inner circle disciples, Peter, James, and John. Those three were present when Jesus raised up Jairus' daughter from the dead. They saw that. They were there when Jesus was transfigured on the mountain. And how scary that, and amazing that must have been when, when Jesus' garments even lit up, the glory of God upon him. Peter, he and Peter were later commissioned by Jesus to prepare a place for celebrating the Passover in the upper room. Again, it was Peter, James, and John that were with Jesus very close by in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, when Jesus was arrested. It is widely believed that it was John who was the first disciple who uh, who was the disciple that entered the court of the priest with Peter when Jesus was on trial. He was the only disciple who witnessed the crucifixion uh, close at hand. He also took Mary, the mother of Jesus, at Jesus' request, home with him. He was the, was the only disciple who was not martyred. He lived to be some 90 years of age. He took Mary home, who was considerably older than he, and watched over her and protected her the rest of her life. 
He was the first disciple to recognize the significance of the empty tomb. On the Sea of Galilee or, or T Tiberias, he was the first who recognized the resurrected Jesus who stood on the shore and gave them directions. And he said to the other disciples, it is the Lord. What a mighty witness this man was, not only in his gospels, but we see him in the early chapters of the book of Acts. Pretty good for a humble fisherman, huh? Don't ever say that my life doesn't count for anything. If we put our, our whole lives into the hands of the Lord, there's no telling what we can accomplish. And here we have this man who wrote the Gospel of John, the first, second, and third letters of John, and it appears the revelation of John that ends the book, the New Testament. So he gives us a powerful witness of the, of the death of Jesus in the passage that we were reading uh, today. Uh, one of the things it says is Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. John is telling us that Jesus is in complete command of his situation. The time has now come for him to surrender or give up his life into the hands of of the Father. Now, when Jesus said, I thirst, we are told a soldier took a sponge full of vinegar, held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the spirit. Interestingly enough, this was written about a thousand years before it occurred. In Psalm 69, 21b, when I say 21b, it means the second half of the 21st verse. Psalm 69, 21b, we read these words, and for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. This is considered to be one of many messianic psalms. Messiah or Savior uh, is what Jesus was. So if there's a messianic psalm, it's something that's being written, maybe in part, maybe the whole psalm, about the Messiah who would come. And many scholars see this as a messianic psalm, something that would refer to what the Messiah would do when he came. And for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Well, it could be a, a double reference. Perhaps David, who wrote these words, maybe experienced something like this. But ultimately, we do know from John's testimony that Jesus experienced that in his crucifixion at the tail end of his life. Usually this vinegar, by the way, was a cheap wine. And it was often provided for the crucified. They would take a sponge and, and dip it in wine, put it on hyssop, raise it up to Jesus's mouth. Jesus, took a little bit of it. He took some of this wine to moisten his parched lips. Remember, he would have been extremely dehydrated by this point in time. He's been on the cross in the hot sun for three hours before the darkness came. He's lost a lot of blood. Pain can make you perspire as well. So he's lost a lot of liquid from his body. He is dehydrated and in great pain that way, in addition to everything else the cross does to you. And he probably could hardly even get the words out. So this helped him to uh, take care of his parched lips so that he would be able to convey those final words for us to hear. 
he had a very important announcement to make. He said, in English, it is finished. Tela telesta. It is paid for. That's what the Greek says. Um, it is paid for. All sin has been atoned for. When the Greeks in the mar were in the marketplace and they were uh, buying and selling, they often used this phrase. Uh, so one person is uh, attempting to purchase something, maybe an urn. And the, the person who uh, had a place in the market, the seller would receive so many drachma, so many uh, coins. And uh, they would then give the urn to the person purchasing the urn. So the transaction was complete. One received coins, one received the item that was being purchased. And the words between the men would be, Teletelesta, it is finished, it's paid for, it's taken care of, deal's done. Jesus died with the cry of a victor on his lips, not with the moan of one defeated. How horrible the pain must have been for those six hours. But when the pain was finally taken away, and he breathed his last breath and crossed the finish line. It must have been an incredible relief and a, and a victory and a joy, a victory that he had accomplished for you and me. He did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Oh, I could love a God like that, couldn't you? John is an eyewitness who noted that he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He died peacefully. Nobody killed him. He gave up his life as one who trusts completely in his father. John also notes something else of importance here. He sees the scriptural significance in the facts that Jesus's bones were not broken and that his side was pierced. Let's take a look at those. You see, it was the day of preparation or the Sabbath, which began sundown Friday evening. According to Jewish law, the dead body of an executed criminal was not to remain upon the tree. In this case, a cross made from a tree, but was to be buried. Deuteronomy 21, 23, in the law of God, well, Moses says, the same day for a hanged man is accursed by God. You shall not defile your land, which the Lord your God gives you for an inheritance. Thus, a dead body had to be removed before sundown Friday night. Remember, he was crucified Friday morning. And he suffered awfully for six hours. So they, the bodies of these three men that were crucified had to be taken down from the cross before evening. Many times the, the Romans left bodies on the cross for days, even after the person expired, as a way to just scare the ever-living daylights out of an everyday citizen. You want to cause trouble? This is what you're going to get. Wow, nice people, huh? But some, of course, lived on. And so they had to do something about this. They had to, to uh, speed up the process of death, which re really was a, a, a relief for these poor souls. So the Romans um, had at hand a heavy mallet, and they would shatter the femur bone. Now that's that large bone where your thigh is. They would do that. They would hit the crucified victim's femur bone and shatter it. One of two things or both would happen. The person would either bleed to death when the, the arteries were severed by the shattered bone, or there would be a lack of oxygen because now uh, the crucified victim had to keep pulling themselves up. At least they could use their legs before 
Now there's, there's nothing there. Their, their legs are broken. There's nothing to push off on. Everything's on the shoulders and the arms and they, they're, they're exhausted. They can't pull themselves up. So they lax into, they become asphyxiated. They lax into unconsciousness and eventually can't get enough oxygen and die. That's lovely. Uh, so the Romans, um, killed or destroyed the legs of the two men crucified on either side of Jesus. Um, this was because, John tells us, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away, again, before sundown. So they broke their legs. But when they came to Jesus, John says, and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Why is that significant? because it fulfills yet another prophecy. Jesus, especially in the cross, fulfilled many, many, many prophecies. Um, in verse 36, John says, he makes it clear, for these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not a bone of him shall be broken. In Psalm 34, 20, this prophecy is uttered. And again, a messianic psalm. It's also um, mentioned in Exodus 12 and Numbers 9. Not a bone of the Passover lamb is to be broken. And Jesus, we know now, on the other side of things, is the ultimate Passover lamb. The lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. The ultimate, ultimate Passover lamb. John also tells us something else that he witnessed. But one of the soldiers, he says, pierced his side with his spear, and at once there came out blood and water. Now, John doesn't know. He, he's not a doctor. He's just telling you what happened, what he saw. A medical doctor will tell you from this description, Jesus was deader than a doornail. Wasn't lapsing into unconsciousness. or He was dead. What happened? his heart ruptured within his chest. He had a massive heart attack, a myocardial infarction of the highest order. He died of a broken heart for you and me. Wow. And the interstitial tissue, which is all over our bodies, but it, has, it holds water. And when the heart ruptures, the blood then mixes with the interstitial tissue's water. And when they pierced his side, blood not just blood came out from the heart, but blood and water came out, which is a surefire sign that he had died. John notes Zechariah's prophecy, they looked on him whom they have pierced. Jesus had fulfilled another prophecy about himself, so John tells us. So they, the call to discipleship is, do you see how much he loves us? And do you see how we can take a simple fisherman or a simple man like me? or you, and use our lives if we're willing to give our whole selves to him, our whole lives to him, to surrender our whole selves to him in every way that we can. It's a very unfair trade. We give everything that we have and own to him, and we receive him and his whole kingdom and being part of his family. Wow, what a trade is that? Wow. So, brothers and sisters, follow him, walk with him. He is the living God, and he loves us so dearly. So let's, let's take a, just a few moments to pray. Lord, we thank you for John and for his amazing testimony that inspires us 2,000 years later as your Holy Spirit helps us to sense what this man experienced, what he saw and touched and heard. Oh, how exciting that is, Lord. We thank you and praise you that you can use um, us to, to make a difference in, in this world. Help us to dedicate ourselves to you, to give ourselves to you, and not be afraid of anything. Uh, you will be with us throughout whatever happens in our lives. We're going to overcome this, and we are overcoming this uh, coronavirus because you're greater than that. And you can take each one of us to make a difference in the world in this point in time. So we thank you and praise you for who you are, the Son of God, who gave his life on a cross for our sins and then raised from death 
to life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Right.